It's almost Thanksgiving. It's almost Thanksgiving, and I'll tell you, I'm super pumped about it. I'm going to have an amazing time, in part because my mega-hot half-Korean beauty queen wife is making your boy some bean pie. (laughs) I'm getting some bean pie for Thanksgiving. If you haven't had bean pie, you are missing out. Kind of like, you know, not nearly as close, but kind of in the same range. No, it's not. Not nearly as close as you're missing out if you're not tuning in, not only here, but over on Reason and Theology, because I was on on Monday. I was on on Monday, super, super psyched. I love seeing those wolves in the chat. We're going to go there in just a moment, right? We're going to get to it. We're not going to do a whole bunch of introductory remarks today. But I need to let everybody know, because if you weren't tuned in, I want to be able to hear that in the headphones. That song. (laughs) I want to hear it loud. (sighs) What an amazing day it is to be alive. And it was amazing on Monday. And why was it amazing on Monday? Because we reached 150 on Telegram. And you know what we did? We howled. We partied. (laughs) I hope you're pumped. I hope you are psyched. I hope you love your Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I hope you love every day. I hope you love every single day rocking out for the Lord. Why? As we say, because today is the day the Lord has made. Because we're going to rejoice. We're going to be glad in it. We're going to be pumped because we're meeting like-minded people living in terrible times. This, This secular age, tumult all about us. And yet, and yet, we come together. We laugh. We share different devotions with each other. Most importantly, we pray. We pray with each other. And speaking of that, actually speaking of that, right out of the gate, I ain't messing around. Right out of the gate. Where is this? I need to go to it right now. Let's go to Telegram right now. Boom. Let's make this happen. Um, I just, let's see, Wolfpack Prayer Chain. Here we go. This. This. Okay. I'm going to try not to cry. I have a friend named Jake Fowler. And anyone who's tuned in to this show for a while has probably seen him in the chat. If you're on Telegram, you love him, right? He's there, him and his wife. And you maybe, hopefully, you saw this uh, life-changing episode. (laughs) I'd like to think every episode of Paleocrat Diaries is life-changing. And, you know, I mean, a little bit, right? A little bit. But that one was really great, you know? And it was on how to prepare for Mass. And it's been really cool getting to know Jake and and everything and getting to know his family. And right here, okay, this, this right here, was it, yeah, it was his wife, is Terry. Okay? Let's see here, where is she? Where is she? <laughs> we gotta go ahead. Yeah, Terry. Yeah, best profile picture in the universe. <laughs> it's the best. Oh, but I want you to just look at this little girl. I want I want her to just be emblazoned in your mind. I want your heart to just burst with this little girl today, okay? Now, in your charity, will you please keep Jake and I's youngest daughter? Now, is it Mary Therese? In prayer, tomorrow, this is today, during the day. We call her lucky number seven. She was born with a liver disease. And I don't know if that would be, is it a biliary atresia? Which has no cure in itself. She had surgery completed when she was three weeks old to essentially reroute her intestine directly to her liver. We will have liver clinic tomorrow. That's today. Okay. Where she will have an uh, echocardiogram on her heart, ultrasound on her liver, and labs to check on how well her liver is functioning. Although we continue to pray for no further complications in all things 
God's will be done. Thank you for your prayers in advance. And please know our prayers for you in return. The people. That's why I tell people, you need to join the Wolfpack chat. It's not a joke. We're not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> a lot of stuff is self-serving. I don't make money on Telegram. There's nothing. It's just, it's just connecting people. But look, look at this. Look at the people who are sitting there and they're praying and people by name. And they know we do this, but we're going to do this right now. Okay. Yeah, we got, oh, he, we even have Deacon in there. Father Deacon. Right? He's been a real, it's been a real pleasure getting to know him. Stephen, Haley, Diana, right? So many people in here I'm talking G, you know, Raphael. These are real people. Pax Domini, that's David. That's the guy he did the, the episode on uh, mental prayer with us. Real people, real time, real prayer. And we get to know each other. People care. And we care right here. We care right here. And so I, I, I've told people, anyone who's following the show, you guys know. You guys know how I roll. You know what I do and what I don't do. And I've only done this a couple times. We're going to do this right now. I want you to pray with me. Okay, I want you to pray with me. Um, nothing fancy, just basic. And just saying, God, we really care about this little girl. We care about her parents. We've gotten to know them. It wouldn't, in a way, it wouldn't matter, but it does, doesn't it? You know, you get to know people. I mean, otherwise, you, you know, we do, we pray for those of the whole world who most need God's mercy. But sometimes we know their names. And sometimes we see their faces and we hear their hearts. We cry with them. We laugh with them. We help them set up OBS so that they look mega dope when they start contributing. <laughs> you know, we do that sort of a thing with each other, right? And sometimes this stuff screams at us and it says, just put the brake on for a moment. It's so easy, isn't it? To just throw up a thoughts and prayer or to like a post and to just walk by and to not think about it again. And when you do, maybe it's such a blur that we don't remember what it was that we were supposed to pray for. It's hard to, it's hard to envision that person to remember in that blur of posts on Facebook and a Facebook feed, that kind of a thing. I don't want to do that here. She's not a drive-by. The Fowlers are not a drive-by. The Wolf Pack, people in the Wolf Pack, you guys are not drive-bys. You're my friends. You're my friends. When I see those wolves, even, even though Jake has this funny thing he does, <laughs> it's, it's inexcusable, Jake. <laughs> it's inexcusable putting wolf in letters, <laughs> in brackets. What are you, man? Some kind of a snowflake. <laughs> you're a mime. You're you're miming wolf. <laughs> you can't you can't mime the wolf. You need to put the wolf emoji on the screen. I'll forgive you though. <laughs> this stuff. Oh man. I want you to pray with me. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, I just ask real quick. I just ask that you just be with that family today. The followers. And you be with their daughter. This is something they've known for a long time. And they've just put their trust in you. They're following procedures and protocols, things necessary. right? Placing a great amount of trust in the hands of doctors who we can only pray are guided by you to find solutions. To come up with means by which she can live a very long and happy and healthy life. But most of all, what they said, we just want to echo that, that whatever it is, and it's hard sometimes for us to understand, but whatever it is, just that we would just accept your will. It's a mystery to us. We don't have, we don't see behind the curtain. And so we have to trust. And in this case, we choose to. And we ask you to give us the grace for this. And so we'll ask with no better words than the ones that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I didn't I didn't plan on any of this, by the way. Man, I didn't plan on starting it. I mean I, I planned on mentioning it. You know, I've gone through some crazy stuff. We all have, right? We've all through we've all gone through crazy, difficult things. In our lives, we've lost people we've loved, you know, maybe we've been injured, um, things like that. Been in a hospital, been scared for our own lives, scared for those, our children. In my case, I lost one. I lost my firstborn, and she died of brain cancer. And, you know, it's difficult. I remember when, I remember when that happened, you know, I wasn't a believer at the time. I had fallen away. I remember my sister, Phoebe, she, uh... She was, you know, she's Orthodox. She's Eastern Orthodox. And we had really big disagreements, the two of us, <laughs> obviously, you know. But I remember going on, on social media and she posted this this picture about, and I saved it. I actually recently saw that I had saved it out of anger, in fact. And um, it's not anger anymore but I, because I didn't understand it. It was a confusing thing. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around this idea that... Um, that it was okay, that God's in control. She shared that when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, my sister, and please pray for her. She she posted that, and, and I remember just the anger in my heart, the frustration in my heart. How, how could you possibly submit to that? How could you possibly say, God, it's your will. A little girl died. A little girl died of brain cancer. How in the world? You know, you've got you've got a cancer in your breast the size of an avocado. How in the world can you possibly say that that's God's will? How can you possibly do that? And I didn't understand. And I was so angry. And it wasn't until like a year and a half later, you know, or about a year, it was less than a year, I guess, after that, we went to church for the first time in like seven years. And I still wasn't all the way there and everything. And, and there were a number of events that transpired after that that helped me come back. And one of those was, I, I remember I started carrying around this, this little flower chaplet. And I brought it with me the first time we went back to church on Christmas Eve of 2017. I had it with me. And it was given to us by my son's godmother, who played a very pivotal role in our coming back. And I remember she told me she gave it to us because when my daughter had cancer, she gave us that chaplet at the hospital. And she said that my relationship with, with Samantha, my daughter, it always reminded her of uh, St. Therese of Lisieux and the relationship she had with her dad and that she prayed this chaplain. It was really, really important to her and that it, it, for a very specific thing in her life. And I won't go into detail here, but just basically the idea is, you know, you, it has the number of beads for the number of years that, that St. Therese lived, right? And, and each one of those beads is simple. You simply pray, a glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. You pray each one of those. That's it. There's nothing more. And I hadn't prayed in seven years, you know. I did one ejaculatory prayer in my life that I just, I just in the moment, I couldn't hold it back. And I, I cried out and I said, Samantha, if you're up there, if you're alive, please help get stuff out of my life that, that shouldn't be in my life. Because I'm lost. I'm, I'm a completely broken man. I'm completely lost. And I don't know what to do. And if I have stuff in my life that I need to get out, and if I need stuff in my life that I need to get in but it's not here, please, please pray for me. Help me. And I scrambled. After I did that, I scrambled. And, uh, well, no, it wasn't the same day. But I was driving in the car, and I remember still struggling with this. And I pulled out that little flower chaplet, and I, I knew what to do. And so I started praying. 
and just one after another after another. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And I thought about it. The more I did that, the more it came out over and over and over, something so so tremendously and terribly profound began happening. And that was that I began seeing that even in these terrible things, somehow, somehow, all that glory still goes to him. Glory be, even in the terrible, even in the trying, those tremendously tumultuous things in our hearts that make us tremble to the core, that somehow this great mystery, one of those many mysteries in this world, is that no matter what we go through and no matter how hard it is, all glory goes to him, whether we recognize it or not. But in that moment, I was proclaiming it. I was accepting it. And I was repeating it over and over and over. And it was like a nail just being hammered in further and further and further until finally I just wept so hard I had to pull over. I could not drive anymore. And it's crazy because... I feel like that's almost symbolic of what happened in the moment anyway. I had to pull over. It was too overwhelming. It was a God moment. And I was submitting. And from that point forward, nothing was the same. Not in my heart. And so it's one of those things that I'm really, I'm really happy I'm really happy, and I'm sorry. I'm not sorry that we started out this way. These are diaries. I, you know, people, I get flagged. People are like, you know, why, why do you call it paleocrat diaries? I'm like, because we're talking from the heart, man. Because this isn't a normal show. I'm not sitting here. I'm not, I'm not your dancing clown. We're friends. We're getting to know each other. We're talking from the heart. Without wanting to push the image too far, you know, my mom used to say it's like living life naked in a glass box. Just the idea that you're putting yourself out there vulnerable in a hole, you're saying, look, I'm not going to hold back. I'm just going to tell you what's up. If you like it, you like it. You don't, you know. I hope you like it later. <laughs> I hope you like it later. You know, but it's one of those things that I've just, I've just learned that, you know, when we get to this place with each other, and we're together and we see we see terrible things it's so easy you know and it's not it's not easy to be bummed out when you see when you see this <laughs> that is not easy to be bummed out <laughs> just look at it america <laughs> look at it world look at that little girl and smile look at that little girl and smile behold beauty behold joy behold light in this world Behold, one of the bazillion reasons we have to say that God is real. Can't you see him in her eyes? Can't you see the faith of their family in her eyes and in her smile? Can't you see it? Can you feel it? Anyway, I'm really glad. <laughs> I'm really glad that we were able to talk. I'm glad that we were able to pray. You know, and I, and I want to say... Um, you know, over here, let me see here. Let me see here. There was, um, well, I guess before we do that, because I'm going to, I'm going to go to the Wolfpack chat. So Andrew Stahl, you don't, don't go anywhere, dude. <laughs> We're chasing you down, Andrew. You may not know this. We are actually chasing you down. <laughs> we found you. <laughs> Where did we find you? Where we knew we would find you. We knew we would find you right here watching the show. Because why? Because you might be the freakiest and geekiest paleocrat fanatic <laughs> in the universe, dude. You write the best comments, man. I made a collage. I made a collage of your comments in on the last program. I put it together. It's like 20-something posts, and at the bottom... Has a nice, nice uh, uh, emoji of the wolf. Talks about being a glad trad. Talks about going to confession. You know about the ambulance chasing, causing the division, going to confession, saying you don't want to do that anymore. All that stuff. Christ the King. 
how you understand the magic of, you know, ya boy. <laughs> you understand it, man. You get it. You get it, dude. You see the smoke signals, don't you? <laughs> you're one of those at the window. You're looking out. You're waiting for those smoke signals. You're going, that's my boy. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it, son. But we're trying to find you. <laughs> we're trying to find you, and we're really glad. Because, look, you have to be a member of the Wolf Pack. I don't know. You said you're going to be. I haven't seen you over there. Am I wrong? Am I mistaken? Am I terribly mistaken? We've been calling you out. We even shared a picture. Where are you, bro? Super pumped you're there. And if you're not there, make sure to go check out the uh, description below. You'll see links to join the Wolf Pack. And that, what you saw just a moment ago, um, that is, um, that's the, the prayer chain. We have a prayer chain we've got um, that's connected to us. So it's, it's, a different, it's a different group, but it's, it's ours. <laughs> it's the Wolf Pack prayer chain. We have a Wolf Pack Luna Pack. So we've got, it's an all ladies group. Apparently, I'm not allowed in. <laughs> Yeah, my wife is though. My wife is though, and she reveals all the secrets. <laughs> no, not really. I'm trying. I'm like, baby, come on. What can I do? Oh man, I don't think she'll ever break. She's pretty tough. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm working on it, boys. I'm working on it. But you got you got the Luna Pack. You know, you got that. You have the book club. We just had a book club meeting last Saturday. It was a whole bunch of fun. Uh, there's actually a fun audio <laughs> where we talk about Roberts Lairdon, uh, who wrote a book called I Saw Heaven. He was watching Laverne and Shirley and our Lord showed up in his house physically, I guess, and, uh, brought him up into heaven. They splashed each other with a kind of, uh, the, the bubbly, they were, they were, they were in the river of life and they were splashing each other, <laughs> playing with water and everything. And then went into, I guess they have a bathroom there. And went into the bathroom, and they both got really high on the Holy Ghost overdose pill. Um, so we talked about <laughs> talked about that <laughs> within the context, in all seriousness, within the context of Saint Teresa's uh, classic work, Saint Teresa of Avila, the in, one of her classic works, Interior Castle. We're going through that, and so you can find that. That's the that's the uh, the Canine Brigade. So we've got that. We've got a resource page where things that we share that are resources in general, people can go, they can uh, check it out, download it. You can see it in picture, video, whatever, various formats there. And of course the chat and my, my personal channel, which is you can't comment there, but I, I highlight stuff. So, cause it can get like 700 comments in a day on the chat. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> that's a cuckoo crazy. People walk in, they're like, what? You miss a couple days. You're literally seeing the, the number. You've missed thousands of notifications. And I, I, I created a, a 10 commandments for how to manage that <laughs> saying, look, learn to skim. <laughs> don't, you didn't, you didn't miss very much. Don't take things too seriously and push that little arrow to go down to the bottom and just catch up to where we are in the moment. It's just a stream of conscience, but make sure to go over there and check it out. But Last thing before we move on to the next the panel um, and, and show the chat real quick. Last thing, I want to share this video. I, um, is it, do I have it in here? Please tell me I've got that. Or did I have it on the next one? Hold on. Oh, I've got it here. I've got it here. So, so I made a video. I shared it. It's, it's just purely comedic, right? But I shared it over at Reason and Theology. A lot of people, though, who watch over here, they don't, they don't follow over at Reason and Theology, kind of cuckoo crazy nonsense but it happens so but this was really fun and it's something that i shared it's from 2007 when i was making apologetics videos on youtube uh made a number of them that uh earned me the 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 hatred right of a lot of atheist people and they just came out of the woodwork i mean these folks and so in the comments they said some you know amazing things <laughs> a lot of f-bombs a lot of calling me you know a turd and a tard and stuff like that they call me really fancy names. I mean, they learned that in college and stuff. But the thing is, like, so, so they, they, the comment section was just brutal, right? And I, and I just played, I had fun with it. I had fun with it. So I made a video where what I did is I took, I took their comments. I summed them up. I got the spirit of it, right? It might not have been, some of them were exact quotes, okay? Some of these are exact quotes. Other ones, it's the spirit of what they said. Uh, I, and the second, the second half of this video, which I think is even funnier, it's only a couple of minutes, second half of the video, I'm not including here because we have some folks who get rankled at certain words, right? Like even if you say, you know, tart or, you know, the, uh, um, 
an illegitimate child. Even though it wasn't me, it's, these are quotes about me, I didn't want to offend the sensibilities of the more sensitive amongst us. <laughs> I said, no, no. I said, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, adopt I, I'm adapting to the weakness of others, and it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. They're like, I'm not weak. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're like, oh, you, may, you might be a little bit. <laughs> you might be a little weak. So anyway, but we love each other, don't we? And so out of love, I said, I'm, uh, you have to go. You have to see the funnier version. That's over on Telegram. But this one, this will give you an idea for what it was. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun. So here we go with uh, Atheist taking it on the chin. Yeah, that didn't, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> hold on a second, I'm, we're not, we're not done, okay, Casimir Black, there we go, there we go, there we go, okie dokie. Yep, this is a video response to Paleo Crat, uh, <coughs> he, uh, he says things like we need to account for the preconditions necessary for knowledge before we talk about evidence, but that's just stupid. Yeah, I willingly grant that the atheistic worldview can't account for any of this stuff, but I basically, I think two things. I think one, we don't really have to, and like two, miracles totally pose a problem for you or something. Somehow, out of nothing, everything came. Somehow, out of nothing, all the uniformity that we've got came. And, uh, kind of a miracle. That guy, always talking about worldviews and presuppositions. What are the odds then? Pretty outstanding. Pretty, uh, pretty... Pretty miraculous, really. That's just, that's ridiculous. I don't mind begging a couple really important questions. Doesn't matter me. Yeah, so like basically I don't feel like I have to actually answer any of your arguments. I just want to like basically say that I think that you're, you are crazy or something. I don't understand why he wants us to have to explain how we can explain stuff. Because obviously, even though we can't account for this, um, I mean, we do it. Sure, we can't account for knowledge or anything, but I mean, come on, we, we do it. I don't understand why we can't beg the question. I don't understand why we can't just ignore this whole worldview thing. I. Ha! All right, we are back. We are now going to enter the octagon of history. I hope you got your coffee ready. I hope you're super psyched because we're going to be rocking out, going through the manuals or guides for young and parenthetical me, old ish er <laughs> Catholic men and women. Okay, they're guides for men and women. Their manuals, here, right here, check it out. Manuals of devotion, you can carry them around with you. I got both. I got both of them right here. I got the, the paper cover. The links are in the description. You can buy them for yourself. They're companions throughout your whole life. I have returned to them multiple times, and why? Because for one, Father Lassance is a saintly man. We gotta get it started. We have to be the ones. <laughs> if it's not already out there, if there's not, if there's not cause for this, we got to start praying for him and invoking, saying, look, if you're up there, if in fact you're already there, pray for us now. Show yourself. <laughs> show, your, show the power of your prayers and intercession for the saints here on earth because we are honoring you. When, you. when you were blessed by the Pope and you were knelt down and you said, my books, my books, my books, we say the same thing. Your books, your books, your books. We're going through, we're learning, bit by bit, chapter by chapter, section by section, and today we're talking about <laughs> gender roles. Oh no, I'm gonna get in trouble. Gender roles, Father LaSanza gonna get in trouble. I'm gonna blame him. Father LaSanza is gonna get in trouble. We're talking about gender roles. We're talking about coming of age. We're talking about the dignity of labor. I'm not just talking about work per se. And we're talking about babies. 
We're talking about putting your hands to the task and saying, look, you got to make it happen. <laughs> you got to make it happen. Now I was talking about manual labor with that one. <laughs> you got to make it happen, folks. It's how we roll. It's what we got to do. And how do we do it? Simple. We commit every single day. We get on our knee, bow our heads, and we say, to Christ the King, everything. We take a knee for Christ the King, restoring all things. And how? By resolving deep inside. Never give up. Keep on smiling and remember that you too and me, we one day shall die. So dream bigger thoughts. Give it the best you got. Rock out. <sighs> pray hard. Pray, pray, pray hard. All right, we are going to go right now. We're going to go right now to scene two. Going to do the uh, real quick window capture. Boom. Up here. Let's see. Oh, yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> look at this. Well, I was talking about Andrew, right? I'm talking about Andrew Stahl. I'm like, yeah, this guy, man, this, this dude, he needs to, uh, he needs to definitely become a member of the Wolfpack. And I said he's the most, he's the most hardcore guy in the chat. And who's the first one? And what does he do? Just a wolf. He's like, he's like, I'm here, boys. <laughs> I'm here, boys and girls. Ow! Yeah, Andrew is loving it. Yes, nice to see you, Andrea. Nice to see you. Ciao. And, uh, Andrew, hello. Paleocrat friends. Yes, it's good to see you, by the way. Good to see you. Jake Fowler. Okay. Oh, oh there he is with that. <laughs> there he is with the bracket wolf. Uh, <laughs> you're demoted, bro. You're so demoted right now. You're done, man. You're through. Yeah, <laughs> gotta, gotta get somebody on that. Yeah, hey, Louie. Hey, Louie and Wolfgang. Get that Fisher Price computer out. You got to demote Jake. <laughs> yeah, they're going to work on it real fast. They're like, what? <laughs> What's that? Did he say something about, you know, a train or a wheel car? <laughs> I think they're going to be like, yeah, he was talking about Paw Patrol cars. <laughs> okay, yeah, Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol Jake. <laughs> yeah, Paw Patrol Jake, man. So, all right, but very glad to see you. Anthony, of course. Dude, you're the man, Anthony. You are the man. He's the he's the head admin. He's the grand canonist over at the Wolfpack chat. You'll see him over there. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Diane. Ah, oh, it's always happy to see. And yes, Diane is a prayer warrior. She's one of those. It's 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 kind of like uh, um, Christine, right? There's a couple folks over there, Haley, that they're just they're prayer warriors. You know, every day. That that's one of the things they just love to do. It's one of the things they love about the chat is that they're praying. Right. And, and that they're praying for each other every single day, offering names up of people in the chat uh, and others and intentions of that. And so very, very, very cool. Um, so, all right. Yeah. Phil, Phil, you are not allowed to copy Jake. <laughs> You're not allowed to copy Jake with that bracket wolf. No, it's not allowed. What are you talking about? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, you're late. What would we have done, Haley? Have you ever thought of that? That's why I'm on time every single show. <laughs> That's why. Because what, what, would, what would the world be if people were just making a habit of being fashionably late? Huh? <laughs> what would happen? Yeah, Brian, it's good to see you. Greetings to you. Yes. Oh, yeah, I've been informed, I guess, that they already told him that they, Andrew, that they haunted him down. Yeah, yeah, I see. It. I see. It. So, okay. Yeah, Brian says, I tip my stove pipe hat to you, sir. Yes, dude, top of the morning to you as well, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Paleocrat, sorry in advance. I'm going to be using the Vitamix blender, and you might hear it in the background. It is for the bean pie. Normally, your boy would be very grumpy about the Vitamix blender going in the background. That's like the mega blender, right? So, I mean, it's just like super loud. Um, but... It's for bean pie, and so I'm actually okay with that. <laughs> I'm actually okay with that. It is absolutely. It's. How could you complain? How could I? How could you complain? I will. I will do this though. I will say it is on one condition, and I know my mega hot half Korean beauty queen wife is listening right now. She always is. She always. She's always tuned in. You know, but um, I'll make it on one condition, and that is that you bring in some cookies. <laughs> you got to bring in those cookies, woman. Stat, you know, I demand it. <laughs> you better listen, woman. <laughs> oh man, she knows. She knows who's boss around here. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, man. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Steven says, dream bigger thoughts. Yes, man. And at the end of the show, I don't know, you know, some people, they may tune out before the very, very end. But if you watch to the end, I have a really uh, powerful video. It's a very short thing. It's just my daughter. Um, she's smiling and moving around. Interestingly enough, with the advances of technology, it's actually a picture that has been brought to life. It's kind of a <laughs> unsettling thing. The first time I ever saw it, I was like, I, that's just a picture. I, this is kind of crazy. But And you hear her voice. And that voice says, uh, I wanted people to dream bigger thoughts. That is her on the news. Okay, that's my daughter, my firstborn who died of brain cancer. Uh, she was being interviewed by the news. She was a Make-A-Wish ambassador for uh, Make-A-Wish Michigan. Um, and so highlighted ambassador of the year. And they came, news came and they talked to her and they asked her, you know, what are you, what are you hoping uh, that people will get from this? You know, from what you're going to do here with Make-A-Wish. And it was to dream bigger thoughts. And so I've included that. In fact... All of those things, right? Never give up. Keep on smiling. I shared uh, recently with somebody, I shared a news clip uh, when she died. The news the news talked about it. They did actually a, a really cool feature on her and talked about all the lives that she touched and stuff. And that was part of the intro, a girl who taught people to never give up and to keep on smiling. And so a lot of the show, when I say it's a Team Tiny Dancer production at the very end of the show... Ooh, look at this. I, I told you that she listens. Hey, baby, where are the cookies? Some cookies? Yeah, right now. Here. You, you got you to gotta feed me. I, my hands are, my hands are just... You, you got to get it up to my mouth. Uh, you got to take it. No, I got to take it. You got to kiss me on the cheek. You got to kiss me on the cheek. Come on. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The only thing sweeter than these cookies and that bean pie are her nice little kisses. <laughs> People are like, what is wrong with this guy? I'm in love, man. Ah, I'm in love. Man, these cookies are good, too. I ain't gonna lie. So, um, so okay. Um, what was I even talking about? Oh, yeah, so <laughs> dream bigger thoughts. I'm like in Dreamlander, guys. My wife comes in. It's like, you know, I'm the mayor. I'm the mayor from the Powerpuff Girls, you know, the secretary and stuff. And I'm like, I'm married to her. <laughs> I'm loving it, man. I am loving it. I'm loving life. So, yeah, but dream bigger thoughts. But it was, it's one of those things that we've incorporated so much of that. And so Team Tiny Dancer, that's the, the name. You know, they have, like, support groups and stuff where it's like, you know, Team... I know it sounds silly, you know, but you got, you got what is it, uh, Team Edward, <laughs> right? Like, you support your team, when when Twilight was around and stuff, and you know, I think it was McDonald's was doing that or something like that. But they, but they do that with you know, like cancer and other kinds of things like that, and they do hashtags. They've you know, uh, for social media stuff like that. So she had hashtag Team Tiny Dancer, and less people are confused. The Tiny Dancer didn't actually come from the song Tiny Dancer. It ended up being kind of a important song in the, her story, but that's not where it came from. It came from a story that I wrote called "She Danced Me a Story." And that is uh, what she asked me to read to her. Uh, and I've shared that with some people. That's um, a story that she asked me to read the morning of her 17-hour brain surgery. She woke up. We were, e we were eating breakfast together. Uh, well, I was eating. I don't think she was allowed. But they said, um, she said, will you just read this story to me, the one about me dancing? And so I did. And in there, it said Tiny Dancer. And she said she wanted that. Well, that's all of that. So you can see the impact of her life and her death uh, and her afterlife on our show and so it's a very important thing um all right we're gonna move on very glad for all of you yeah andrew says cookies and coffee breakfast of champions you better believe it i haven't even done the straight to the dome yet but i got my orange straw mm. Mm. bypassing that blood brain barrier <laughs> yeah vm veronica she's our scientifically minded person uh, our our librarian Britbot over at the Wolfpack chat, and she 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 testifies that that's true. She's verified it, done a lot of studies. So there's a lot of scientific studies <laughs> that talk about. It. I'm waiting for the day that YouTube puts a little disclaimer, and they're like, no, drinking coffee through a straw is not going to allow caffeine to bypass the blood brain barrier. And we're like, yeah, you say that about a lot of stuff. <laughs> we don't believe you anymore. <laughs> You're a liar. You're a liar. So, all right. Very, very, very glad. Uh, Potter says the wolf revolution. It's true, isn't it? It's true. You know, it's it's one of these things. I mean, people have, people have talked about, like, what is this? Like, what what is the show? And I think that's why, I think that's why 
uh, David. Actually, did I show that? Did I show that on here? I think I did. I think I showed the video. Uh, yeah, I did. I did. The, the video of uh, David Gray, right? And it was over on Old Fashioned Catholics. Because I showed. I also showed it on Monday. Um, I think I showed it on here. I think I showed it twice. So I showed it on both channels. Um, you know, but he, he's, he says, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure what it's about. You know, it's one of these things because it doesn't fit the mold, man. It doesn't fit the mold. We're doing we're we're doing something different, you know. We're we're legit building a community for real. Like you know, talking to people, getting people connected. Everybody saying, "Look, this is what I'm good at. It's what I love. This is what what I really enjoy doing. This is what I can do to the extent that I can do it." And we're getting to know each other in that way, building building up and saying we're striving to be saints and laughing all the way. Right? We're whistling while we work, and it's true. We're having a good time living life. We're genuinely grateful to be here. It's a valley of tears. It's true. But at the same time, you know, I got to be glad that I've met you. I got to be glad that you're praying for me and that I'm praying for you. Right? So we're in it together. We're in it together. And this is, this is just rocking. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rocking the stratosphere. People are like, I don't know what to do with this. It doesn't fit that mold. Why, why doesn't he talk like everybody else? Why, 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 why does he show this way? Why does he, why does he ramble on and he, you know, interjects thoughts and he's getting emotional and he's, you know, everything else. Like, what's that all about? Why, you know, why, why read from a book? Why not just simply talk? You know, or why not, why not do the thing that makes it sound like all the, so many other shows where it sounds like a sports talk show, right? I mean, you turn on sports talk, that's nothing against that. I mean, that's a style, you know, but to say, man, we're, we're, we're different. We're different. We're we're uh, we're pushing boundaries left and right, pushing buttons left and right, pressing the envelope every day. That's what we're doing. We are on the front lines of all of this. So very very glad, and I, and it's because of folks like you. It you know you know I I play a role. I mean I'm the guy here. I'm you know I got I'm the Kaiser. I mean <laughs> you know I'm the Kaiser, but at the same time this is not a personality driven thing. This is a people driven thing. These are folks that genuinely are striving really hard to live life as saints and saying that, man, we got to do hard, better than ever. We got to work harder than ever because we're living in wicked times. We're living in wicked times. So we got to pray hard. We got to learn to fast. We've got, we've got to learn to follow the liturgical cycle. We got to really get into that and allow that to give us a rhythm and a rhyme to our lives to study history, to understand where we came from, who came before us, what's the democracy of the dead, how is that informing my life, and what role what role ought that to have in my life, and that I hope that it would have in the future, because one day I too will be part of that democracy of the dead for future generations, and that we see how this works together, and that we recognize, we recognize the conditions of, of the battlefield at the moment, and that we, we know, we realize that, you know what, hey, look, maybe we're like the Davy Crockett, right? Or we're the swamp fox. We're like the swamp fox of modern apologetics. That, that people are so accustomed in, apo in the apologetics world to stand in across from each other like they did back in the day. You know, they're like gentlemanly and such. And they're standing across from each other with cannons and everything. And they're like, all right, folks, it's time to uh, die now. <laughs> and they're like, okay, for victory. And they die. And they're over. And everybody's standing there doo, 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 doing that kind of thing. And I'm like, no, dude, we're swamp fox. We're swan fox. We're, 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 we're learning the terrain. We're learning, you know, where, how do people hide? How, how do we end up, you know, doing different techniques of warfare? How do, we, how do we deal with this, not only to protect the fortress, not only to, to protect the castle and to go all around it, but learning how to properly invade and to invade in a way that's not looking to either just enjoy the fight or to sit there and say, I want to crush the enemy, but to say, look, I want, I want to take this person captive, but captive to Christ, not to me, not beholden to my syllogism, but beholden to salvation and to a savior. Swamp foxing it up, baby. <laughs> we are swamp foxing it up. All right. We're done with that. Yeah, I love all you guys. Okay. The bow of work. It's the serious side of life, okay? The smiling, careless, innocent days of childhood are but brief. Swiftly do they pass away, almost before the young man and woman, because I'm, I'm blending them, right? So you'll, th this one, 
a number of these are going to be from uh, the the um, the boys guide starts it off and then it goes to the girls guide. I have a, a bunch of different colors because I, I did this. I don't know how long ago. And it was, I only had the yellow highlighter at the time. Uh, you'll see the manic highlighting <laughs> come up pretty soon. That's from the woman's guide. But I blend them together, okay, for ease. Otherwise, it's, you know, <laughs> come on now. Come on now. Okay. So, so here's the thing, right? So, all right. Almost before the young man has begun to learn how great is their value and to prize them as he ought. So we, 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 we all know this, right? Time hits us hard. It's one of those things where we tell we tell youngins, right? We tell them all the time that you know you're, you 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 don't even realize how quickly life will pass you by, and it only gets worse, doesn't it? All right? It only gets worse. Like as you get older, it seems like the time is flying by even faster. <laughs> the, the relative awareness of time, the way that we experience it in our lives, you're you're kind of you 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 reach that point. <clears throat> you reach that point where you you start wondering if maybe you're you're kind of like in a midlife crisis and you say oh no i think that's like when you're like 60 you know 50 something or 60 and then you look at how old people are generally when they die and you realize dude i'm like 43 <laughs> oh no oh no i'm kind of at that peak that peak place and everything's going down from here everything is going down and you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing the bags under your eyes you're seeing all of the, you know, ro- the Rand McNally roadmap, right? Whenever you smile, you got all the creases and stuff. You're like, when did that happen? <laughs> oh, no. Dentists are talking to you about weird things. And you're like, oh, man, this ain't cool, man. <laughs> like, how is, this, how is this happening? Because life passes by. Because we come of age, right? And youth, it's one of those things where the, 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 the kids, when you're a kid, it's like your your awareness of of time and the way that it plays out in life. It's it's much different, right? The way that we imagine the world, the way that we imagine um, our place in it, the way that sequences of events happen. The closest thing they get is, "Oh, at Christmas, that's a long ways away." <laughs> that's all they think. And for us, we're like, "It's not far enough. Like it's coming soon," <laughs> and and it seems like it's creeping up closer and closer all the time, right? What is the serious side of life? It is the season of work, okay? But before we do this, before we do this, we got to look into the value of work and say, okay, well, what is work exactly, right? He goes through and he's talking about the value, what it is, and and so we're going to lay it out in the structure that he has here. You must not immediately connect with, uh, with the idea of work, the idea of toil, fatigue, and degradation, which pertains to a, uh, a slavish occupation. For everything must, in fact, be won by work. Everything which does not grow of itself like fruit on a tree. All right. So how often when we think of work, how often when we think of work, do we immediately think of things that are exhausting? We think of toil. We think of, oh, I got to wake up another day, another dollar. It's that kind of resignation to the task. And that's okay. But if someone says, well, what is work? And if the very first thing out of your out of your mouth is another day, another dollar, you know, or I'm working for the man, that kind of a thing, you got to change this. You got to change the, the, the spectacles. You got to look at it different. You got to start having a God's eye view of what work is. It's, it's, it's a matter of renewing your mind and renewing that sight. And in doing so, you're going to renew the language. You're going to renew the way that you talk, the way that you live the way that you view others and your interaction with others, even in the workplace, maybe especially in the workplace. In what light ought work to be viewed? Okay, Philo Sant says, man, as the image of God, in a way takes part in his creative activity. Do not misunderstand me, for of course I did not mean that man and and woman can make something out of nothing. That would be, you know, (laughs) you can't do that. If somebody's like, hey, man, I made something out of nothing. It's one of the the tricky things about calling yourself a creator. It is an interesting thing to call yourself that. You know, even if you created something, there is a sense by which that's true. But there's also a sense in which that's not true. Okay? You're assembling things and putting things together, but you aren't creating even those things that are put in because you can't. Right? You're still playing with, you're, you're still 
tinkering with how you put things together to create other things. God didn't do that when he created. He's not tinkering with stuff and saying, let me get, let me get a little bit of time over here and a little bit of energy over here. <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit of matter and dump that into the mix, a little spice and everything nice and make myself some creation. <laughs> like, it's not how it worked. My error. But people have power to impart to substances various forms and by light of their understanding to arrive at a continually increasing comprehension of higher things. Think about that. Right, I mean, how profound right out of the gate is it that he's talking about work and he's not even saying like, we make stuff so that we can accomplish tasks. And so often you say, well, why would you make something? Well, I, I want to make an app that will help me do this and this and this. And that, that's true. There's a, there's a layer of, of our lives where that would be unquestionably true, right? However, however, for the saintly Lassance, <laughs> for the saintly Lassance, the idea behind this is that we can, we can, um, we have the power to impart to substances various forms. And by the light of his, of our understanding, we can arrive at a continually increased comprehension of higher things. Now, all this is achieved by means of exertion, labor, and work. And this is where it gets into the girl's guide. So I'm sorry if there's any, if there's any confusion as we go along. And if you've got, if you got your paleocrat diary, where I actually want to start uh, putting them together. I got a, a friend I've, I've talked to. He he says there's uh, these notebooks. He he knows how to do this. He even went and did a, I think it was an Amazon class on it, if I remember right. Um, and so uh, we're gonna put together uh, paleocrat diaries for people. So if they would like to, you know, m maybe even make it something that the twenty five dollar club. And I and if you're a twenty five dollar member, I got something coming for you. Okay. Uh, I sent out a package recently to uh, Samuel. He's, I can't say what it is, <laughs> but I can say he's going to be very happy. Might not get it for a minute because I had to pay boatloads of cash to send it to Australia, right? <laughs> but neither here nor there. Okay, we're moving on. I don't want to get mad thinking about Australia because it makes me <laughs> it makes me angry. I'm seeing that. I said, holy cow, man, these people, this is rapacious. You know, but but we're, we're going to have some stuff for that, for the group and stuff. Um, you know, but... The thing is, is that, you know, it might, it might get a little bit confusing. So, okay, back, back to this. I, I'll get distracted. <laughs> I'm going to get so distracted. And I, and I got the Vitamix in the background thinking about bean pie. I'm definitely distracted. You're killing me out there. <laughs> Work is a twofold nature, either mental or physical. Both are indispensable to the well-being of human society. Okay. We have to, so, so your mind and your hands, you've got stuff that you've got to do. With your mind, you have to learn, okay? And there's an interplay between these things, right? You learn things which may, which motivate you to work with your hands, right? Or at least to accomplish tasks, right? And when you accomplish tasks, oftentimes you mess up in the process by which to get there. <laughs> or in having accomplished it, you realize that there were other things you could have done to make it even better. So there's this interplay back and forth, these two different dimensions to this. So you got to direct your attention at home, right? In days of old, under the roof of the Holy House in Nazareth. So when you're looking and saying, what is the value of work? What is work? How is it done? Why should I do it? What does he tell us to do? Direct our attention where? To my job out in the workplace? Should I, should I direct my attention to, you know, uh, uh, listings in a newspaper or online? He says, no, no, no. Before anything else, you got to look back under that roof of the Holy House in Nazareth. Because the ancient heathen despised labor, right? You had this, the so-called freeman considered it a degradation to employ himself in manual labor. We find this dislike and contempt of work prevailing everywhere throughout heathendom. Laborers were considered to be mere animated machines, which their owners were free to treat in whatever fashion they might see fit. They were bought and sold like any other goods and, and chattels. So you, you, you say... Look at the way that the world views it. Look at the way, how, how dispensable, by the way, if you want to see to what extent that kind of a, a thing is still there, how often are you made to feel as though you're, you're, the dignity of what you're doing when you go to work is boiled down to the bare minimum of how much time you've existed there? Nothing to do with the productivity. 
nothing to do with any other consideration whatsoever, but the amount of seconds on a clock that you're there. And the idea of paying you the bare minimum that they have to without any consideration under some supposed market market value or some saying, well, they're, they're willing to work for slave prices. <laughs> I don't need to take into consideration any other uh, notion of justice surrounding that. How often do you feel that way? How often do you feel that if you were let go, it wouldn't affect anything at all? Is it hard to sense, uh, is, is it hard to have a sense of dignity for yourself? And I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. I'm saying, in fact, that it does. However, is it difficult to sense that? Is it easy to feel like, well, I'm dispensable. I don't need to have me. They could fire me today. The owner would never even know. Maybe hardly anybody would. I'm just a cog in a machine. Do you feel that way sometimes? That, I, I, I believe that that system... That system is only true insofar as we haven't er eradicated heathendom from the way that we view work, from the way that we view people who are working for us, right? The laborers, insofar as we view management, insofar as we view uh, the economy and the role of jobs in an overall economy. And if you want to hear my views on that, I won't go too deep into that right now. Uh, I'll, I'll just simply say that we've been talking about that on the Monday morning show having debates over political economy, the Catholic magisterium, um, the, the, the field of economics, stuff like that. We've been talking about that on Mondays with Tim Flanders and Kennedy Hall, bright and early, five in the morning. <laughs> so if you want to hear more about that, you can go ahead and, and tune in um, over on Media Catholic. Brayer, then Jesus Christ appeared, right? So you have, you have this view of labor, you have this view of laborers, you have individuals that they're like, you know, yeah, they're, they're just you know, kind of cattle. These, are, these are, are like machines out there. They're just fit for that. That's what they're fit to do. You know, kind of looking at like workhorses and saying, well, this workhorse here would be really good at, at, at pulling this carriage. And that's kind of the way that some people would look at individuals. There's a matter, in a way, some of that's true. I mean, I, I used to work, for example, you know, you're, not everyone is fitted for the exact same thing. We're created differently, right? So like I used to work at Menards. I don't know if, if any of you guys, if you know what Menards, you know, you can save big money at Menards. <laughs> and so uh, the thing is, is like uh, at Menards, I worked in the, you know, where you're selling carpet. You had these really heavy rolls of carpet, but they, they didn't want to appear. They didn't want to appear as if they were recognizing any gender roles. They were doing the equalitarian nonsense. So they're like, oh, yeah, we need to hire some ladies in here. And they're like, yeah, they had a board meeting. Oh, OK, yeah, let's see. What should we do, boys? People are starting to think that maybe Menards is a little bit, you know, uber-masculine. Because we're selling a bunch of things to do with wood and, you know, lumber and tools. We're, so we got, we got hammers and wrenches and toilets and lighting fixtures. And we need more ladies. And they're like, okay, where should we put the ladies? And they said, uh, uh, why not selling carpet? <laughs> that would be great, except that none of the ladies, and I worked with many, none of the ladies could do it because those carpet rolls are just gigantic. They're gigantic, extremely heavy. So you would constantly need to be called out to say, hey, look, can you please come help me because I can't do this? A dude could, right? All the dudes who were there. So there's a, there's a dynamic of that. I'm sure that there's, you know, some husky women out there who would be able to do it. <laughs> I'm not denying that. Right? There's some ladies that I, well, I wouldn't want to fight them. <laughs> like, I mean, they're pretty tough. I ain't going to lie. You got to wonder if they're taking SARMs or something, you know, but like, you're like, what are you doing, lady? You know, how'd you develop that Adam's apple? <laughs> you know, but they're, they're, you know, they're burly ladies. <laughs> they're very strong. And you get that kind of like, you know, the, the wife on uh, planes, trains and automobiles. You know what I'm saying? The wife whose baby came out sideways and she didn't cry a bit. And she's all like spitting that chewing tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> that chick, she could work in the carpet department over at Menards. <laughs> she could work there. But the thing is, when Christ appeared, changed everything. The God-man, our Redeemer. He did not choose for his foster father one of the Roman emperors, a member of the Senate, or a sage. No, no. He chose a man whose whole life was spent in hard labor, a carpenter, an artisan. And next to the temple of God, the workshop was the place where our Lord liked best to be. What dignity 
This fact confers upon labor. This is a dramatic thing. We call him, he's, he's Christ the king. Christ the king of the universe. And yet, what does he do? Comes down in a manger, totally true. Totally true. Was it, was it just a stop? There was just, just no room in the inn on, a way, uh, on his way to the throne room? No. It was what would eventually land him in the carpentry shop with wood and with nails, watching his father, watching his father work hard, watching his mother work hard at home. Mary, his blessed mother, was no fashionable lady caring only for society and amusements, for dress and novels. We see her in the peaceful house of Nazareth, industriously uh, pursuing the ordinary evocations of a poor artisan's wife. From that day forth, how different is the aspect of work when viewed by the light of the Catholic faith, by the light of the workshop of Nazareth, where the God-man, Jesus Christ, diligently helped his foster father and handled the saw, axe, and plane. You know, it's, it's one of those things in, in many, many ways we're talking about in the eyes of society at large, Johnny Q. Sally Sue. So the incarnation, the incarnation, right? That, that, that place where you begin to just flood physical things, right? And you say, man, the, the God man, where does he reside? Did he reside in some guru in some temple somewhere? And some aristocrat high atop, you know, <laughs> the towers of a palace. A professor at some university. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Instead, he not only went to this pretty obscure place, <laughs> to be quite frank, a pretty obscure place in the, in the Roman Empire, but also, also to land himself in a home of Johnny Q and Sally Sue. Normal, everyday folks. Nothing nothing super reputable aren't you from that little town over there aren't you that guy isn't your dad a carpenter or something you ain't nothing special doesn't that just make your heart just smile to know that doesn't that isn't that something that you can have there's there's a sense of camaraderie that you say look you know some people say well you know how could he possibly understand what i go through in my life because he lived it because he lived it, he, you know, he wasn't in a, in a, in a uh, the lap of luxury, silver spoon kid. It's the rough and tumble of life. He had to, they had to work for what they had. They couldn't, you know, call the grand, the, the granny nanny state and say, hey, look, we want you to, to hook us up fat with some help. So keep your gaze constantly fixed upon that workshop and learn to be faithful, assiduous in your work and regard it as honorable, whether it be easy or difficult, servile or otherwise, consider it to be a precious remembrance, a priceless relic of the house of Nazareth. How would that change your life? How would it change your life if whatever you do, I, and I don't, I don't know what everybody does in the, in the comments or anybody watching the show, but when you're, when you're doing your work, do you think of yourself and what you're doing and where you are? Do you think of it in terms of that, that it's a priceless relic? a priceless relic of the house at Nazareth? Do you imagine yourself working as Jesus worked? Are you imagining yourself working as our, as our lady worked? As St. Joseph worked? And if not, why? Why don't you see it that way? And if you say, well, I'm allowing the world, you know, around me, and, you know, the, my boss is treating me bad. People are treating me bad. I, 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 don't, I don't feel like I can do that kind of work, you're missing a bigger picture. It's, it's one of the reasons that it makes so much sense when, when the apostle tells us, when you do work, you're not doing it for eye, you're not eye pleasing. You have to look actually beyond that person. You need, you need to look so kind of through them in a way that you can see who they are and say, I am working for you. I am doing my best and I know that you're there. I'm not oblivious to your existence. In fact, I am, I am maximizing my work in your sight but not for your sight. I'm not doing it for you. I give every, because otherwise, would you really give your best if you were, it's like every day I'm working really hard for my manager in the toilet department. <laughs> like, is that, is that going to pump you up? At the insurance agency. It's like office space. 
How many of you watched Office Space and kind of chuckled? You don't even have to have an office job like that, but you still recognize that overlap. You didn't have to work in that weird restaurant, right? The weird restaurant with all the flair where they had to, they were super fake pretend people. You're not very flared today. You need more pins. You're doing the bare minimum. Is that easy to, to, to work really hard and to view that person and say, man, I'm, I'm working really hard because I want to impress that person. How shallow and, and how futile. How often is that going to result in something you want? And then when you finally, if you, if, you, if you dedicate enormous amounts of time, let's say even just one year, that's an, if you think about it, you know, if you live till, you know, 75 years old, you've just that's one seventy fifth of your entire life. And that's actually a lot of time. And you sit there and you say, man, I worked for a year and I've worked so hard and I'm trying to really do it for this, my manager to show him that I really am doing a good job and, and I'm hoping to get a, 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 you know, some kind of a bonus. And he's like, we're going to pay you an extra 25 cents an hour or an extra 15 cents an hour. How bummed out would you be? You'd feel deflated. I mean, wouldn't that feel like somebody's flipping a quarter at you and telling you to go play the lotto? And, you, and it would be easy to get disgruntled, to feel like really, really kind of jaded and say, man, I, don't, don't they understand my life? And, and <laughs> Father Lassans would say, well, sometimes no, they don't. Because they, maybe they don't understand their own lives. And, they don't, and, and they've been uh, bewildered and bewitched by a, a political economy that views people simply as it's very dehumanizing. Right, the way that they view it, they don't they don't take in to to account a more holistic understanding of who you are and what people are and what society is and the role that it plays within a grander picture. It's just that one place and it's just that one worker and it's that one hour for that certain set amount of money. That's all. But God isn't that way. God doesn't do that. God sees you, and you might not get your money right now, right? You, you might you might have to wait a really long time. You might have to wait and say, well, you know, you're saying you're saying one year's long, Jeremiah. Well, I'm gonna have to wait sixty years. And you go, yeah. The difference is, it, after that amount of time, if you if you add up all of the, let's say you give it all you got, and you're disgruntled and you're frustrated, you feel dehumanized, you feel used in everything else. You're giving your best, and you just don't feel like you're getting the remuneration that's necessary for what you do in your life. That you do that, and after all those years, you add that up. And then you die. And you take none of that with you. None. You, you, could, you could tell everybody in your will, say, look, I want all of my belongings and all of my money. I want it to be wrapped around me like the, you know, <laughs> the pharaohs in the olden days. And I want to I want to go down to the grave surrounded by my belongings. And you still are taking none of it with you. But what you have stored in heaven, you'll be dealing with for eternity. It's a long game. That's tr that's true work. That is good. That, that's true remuneration. That is just for what you did and did not do. To this end, lay the lay to heart the description of the industry befitting a woman. So he's talking about women in this particular situation. This might give me in some trouble a little. This might give me a little easy easy bit. Okay. And Solomon says in the Proverbs, she hath sought wool and flax and hath wrought the counsel of her hands, wrought by the counsel of her hands. She is like the merchant's ship. She bringeth her bread from afar. She hath risen in the night and given a prey to her household and victuals to her maidens. She hath considered a field and bought it. With the fruits of her hand, she hath planted a vineyard. She hath girded her loins with strength and has strengthened her arm. She hath tasted and seen that her traffic is good. Her lamp shall not be put out in the night. She hath put out her hand to strong things, and her fingers have taken a hold of the spindle. She hath looked well to the paths of her house, and hath not eaten her bread idle. I know a lot of people that take this, and I, this is where it's going to get me in trouble. I know a lot of people that take this and they say that a woman ought never to actually do kind of manual labor, that they got to simply do the only things that they should do are in relation directly to the home, right? So like cleaning up the house, making sure dishes are done, 
making sure food is prepared, making sure kids are taken care of, making sure that they're washed, making sure that they've got their clothes hemmed, things like that, that they are, they are the managers of the home base. And this is true. But she went out and bought a field. She planted a vineyard. Right? She strengthened her arm. She tasted and saw that her traffic is good. In fact, if I remember correctly, didn't she go to the gates? The people at the gates even knew who she was. Why? Because they probably bought stuff from her. (laughs) They probably bought stuff from her. Now, her home base would have been out of the house, at least in this particular situation. But the idea, you know, I I think that this is a a more robust picture of a woman than many traditional people would like to believe. I do. I, it's it's kind of like how John Chrysostom talks about, talks about, um, uh, who was it, man? Was it Sarah in the Old Testament? You know, it got herself up on, on, uh, uh, on a donkey or whatever. You got, got herself up on an animal, right? To, didn't need the help. Did it herself. It's the kind of woman she is. He describes her as being strong. Right, that she's this kind of woman that's able to just do this. Maybe she was agile. I mean, I don't want to just think she was, you know, <laughs> Bluto, <laughs> but a chick. I'd like to have my imagination with what she looked like, you know. But the, uh, but either which way, strong. She didn't. She didn't wait around for that sort of thing. Took initiative in that way. And so, so, and 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 made clothes. True for family, but but it would be no surprise. In fact, it would be surprising. If it was, well, yeah, so you do really good making clothes at home for your kids. It's better than the clothes that I make, especially with the division of labor that they had. For, for them to say, yeah, you're really good at, at making those things, but, you know, I'm not interested in purchasing any of those. Highly unlikely. It's much more likely that people would begin to ask the question to say, hey, you know, do you make that stuff? Could you work for me? Now, maybe, maybe she taught them. But there's nowhere that I see in the Bible that says that this woman that's praised, that she goes to the gates and that all the men at the gates are saying, hey, thank you for coming over and teaching my wife how to do it. And maybe she did. But it does say she went out and bought stuff, that she planted stuff, and that the traffic was good. But she wasn't idle. And this is true for men and women. Think about this. Think about, you know, you you get... uh, you get in nowadays, especially how, how many people are idle? And I, I, don't, I don't mean to call anybody out on this, but well, I kind of do a little, you know, right now I am working. It's one of the many things I do. And people who are at the Wolfpack chat, they know they, they've learned all of the different things that we do. In fact, and all the things I do pale in comparison to the kind of lifestyle that, that people like Tim Flanders live. I mean, that guy's a real workhorse for real. I mean, he's constant. You know, I, I have enough time to sit around and joke sometimes with people. There's times I do that where I shouldn't, you know. But how many people are at work and maybe shouldn't be watching, but they are? I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. Because <laughs> I don't want to burn anybody. But I got to remind them, they can watch this later too. And they can talk with us during their free time. Because ultimately, they're not they're not working and getting away with something because the person's not seeing, their their boss is not seeing them, um, because your boss will, in fact, see you, because your boss is God. And, he, and he's watching what you do and do not do. But how many days do we sit around and we're idle? That, that, that when we're done working, that we just sit there like lumps on a log, couch potatoes, getting fatter by the second, getting fatter so fast, in fact, we can hear ourselves getting fatter. If we can even hear ourselves over top of our hands shuffling through the bag of Doritos. You know, and the, and the YouTube that's playing on the screen. Or the video game at the tip of our fingers. And we become idle. That we're not, we're not active in that way. How many of us have been, have been duped by even a five-day or a five day work week? How many of us have just completely bought into the idea of a five-day work week and then we, we are confused a little bit as to why Sunday isn't so special anymore. I'm serious about that. I work six days. 
I work six days. I, I, I do not take Saturday. I don't sit there and say, well, I'm going to I'm going to uh, have Saturday because essentially Saturday is Sunday without mass. It's all it is. It's how it feels like the, the way that it's lived for most people. Especially if you're not doing any work at all, then it really is. I mean, you're, you <laughs> you go to mass, but other than going to mass and spending time with family, maybe you're doing that on Saturday, too. So you just have two Sundays now. And to me, I say, dude, no, I, I work six days. And on Sunday, it, we turn that off. We got that work switch and we go, boom, and it shuts down. We're learning now to get our work done on Saturday, like Saturday, making sure, we, we, and we need to put together like a checklist to put it together and say, man, we got we got to have some kind of a list out that says, um, you know, what are, what are the projects that need to be done before Sunday arrives so that we don't do it on Sunday? Because if you get to Sunday and you go, well, we don't have any food or we didn't plan ahead on this or we didn't, you know, we got to go and we got to work on this project because we got to get it done by Monday. But you've known that's on you. That's on me. And so we got to be better about it. It says you may perhaps during your school days have learned all sorts of fine things, right? Foreign languages, delicate embroidery, drawing, music, etc. Boy, man, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> if, if, if young ladies, especially, right? If that's what they were learning. Now they're learning how to TikTok. <laughs> they're learning how to TikTok it up. I got my phone on. I got my phone on, girl. Yeah. Doing those dumb TikToks where their mouths aren't even lined up with the music. They're doing stupid things that everybody else is doing. Mindless drones. That's not a culture, girl. You want to find out more about what it, about raising girls and what I believe about raising girls, right? I actually have a podcast about it. I would amend it on certain things now. I'd put it together a little bit differently. But it's still, yeah, but you can see it. I think it's... Uh, Raising Daughters Right, and it's in my it's in my Paleocrat Diaries playlist on my YouTube channel, Paleocrat. Your best and truest vocation, however, talking about the ladies, the vocation intended for you by God is to occupy yourself in the house. Honor these domestic duties and attend to them industriously, right? So you have to you have to do your best with industry. But your primary emphasis, where, where is your home base? Okay? Because that's the best and the truest. It doesn't mean it's the only. And that's what I would say. I would say, it doesn't mean only. And this is where people get lost. But I'd say your best and your truest is in your home. And you know, it's one of these things. There's, um, there's a, a, a guy, and I, I, don't, I don't endorse all the stuff he says. In fact... There's a lot of stuff he says that I'm like, that's just downright dumb. I mean, this is just wrong, what he's saying. But he's talking about things that are actually important for many modern women. And his focus is actually in, in addressing modern men and women. And specifically, he's, a, he's an African-American guy, and he's mainly talking to the African-American community. But his, the principles apply, right? It's just a, these are general understandings of how people engage in what you do and stuff like that. And he, he has these ladies on. He may, his name is Kevin Samuels. And he'll go through and he talks about, um, you know, uh, women, modern women who are, are really frustrated and they feel really alone. And they feel really lonely and they don't understand why they're not with, with, with um, high value men. But yet they want a high value man. And a lot of ladies would say, no, I don't, I don't want a high value man. And he'd say, well, do you want to have kids? Yes. Do you want to um, have to work to survive? Like not, not work out of like an elective, but say you want to work so that you, uh, you, you, do you want to make it so that you have to work to pay the bills that would even be necessary for you to live where you live and the lifestyle you have? Most of them say no. I mean, who wants, who wants to have to do that? So they say, well, no, I don't want to have to. Well, then that means that you want your man to have to. Somebody has to. And so, so if that's what's happening and you don't want to be part of that, that's, that's like, a, that's like a, 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 um, a relic, it's a fragment, right, that's left over. Residual effects of a, of a day and age long gone, right, embraced by people who identify as traditional. That says, that says you know, I, I would like to be at home and I would like that guy to go out and work and to make enough money that we can make kids together and have a home and have a car or more than one car and to have all of these amenities of life 
and I don't want to have to work to make to reach the bare bottom of that threshold, right? The minimal amount necessary to have those things. I don't want to work for that. And he says, what do you bring to the table? What do you bring to the table? And most of them don't know. I'm good at loving. He says, well, you know, do you have any kids? Yeah, I got two kids. Are you divorced? Nope, never married. (laughs) How old are you? 35. Good luck. Good luck with that. I don't mean to be rude, but you are like, you know, I I know some folks they are, you know, 40 some years old. Divorced, end up having, you know, a couple different kids, a couple different dads in the scene, you know, and they're they're frustrated because the pool seems really, really limited for them. That's because it is. It's because it is. And you say, well, how, you know, how much do you weigh? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a little, I'm a little bigger. You're like, well, how much bigger? Well, you know, I should probably lose about 40 pounds. You exercise it? No. You taking care of yourself? No. You wearing your socks with sandals outside and sweatpants? Yeah. <laughs> you know, come on now. Give me a break. What are you providing? What are you bringing? And so if the truest vocation is something in the home, then you got to really learn what you're doing in the home. If you want somebody who's a high value man, or if you're a man who's striving to be a high-value man, then what do you, who are you going to look for? As a woman, what kind of man are you going to look for? And when you find that man, number one, are you around those men? And number two, if you're not around those men, how do you, are they going to come to your door and knock on it? I'm dead serious. Are they going to come to your, are they going to come to your house and knock on your door and be like, yo, I'm a high value man. I make a lot of money. I don't know you and you aren't that hot or anything. And I don't know what skills you've got, but I want to, you know, be in a relationship with you. That's fantasy land, man. That's fake. Same thing with dudes. If you're sitting around all day long and you're just playing a bunch of video games all day long, eating Doritos, shoving pizza down your throat. And you're sitting there another day, another dollar guy, and you don't have any vision beyond that. You're not planning beyond that. Why should that woman, why should that woman even care about you, man? Yeah, Corey in the comments says, I've seen some of Kevin Samuels. I think they all have the natural law desire for these things, but can't articulate it. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. I'm saying the remnants of those things, right? that we embrace, because we're embracing the natural law in this, and that they don't know, they're not understanding how to flesh that out because they're discombobulated because of the modernity, the modern expectations of women. That's why people get offended when people talk the way I'm talking now. You know, but the idea, you know, yeah, and David the Hermit says, this show has become way serious. <laughs> A little bit sometimes. It's it's going to get back to being kind of crazy. Actually, I'm going to start doing some comedic shows over at Paleocrat. We've been talking in the we've been talking in the Wolfpack chat about it. I'm going to do some shows. Probably one at least one a week. It'd be a nighttime show. And it'll be almost purely just funny, edgy type stuff. Not what I could do over here. Could not do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I'd be I'd be violating the brand, the the continuity of the brand and the optics and all that jazz. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, so it is a little bit serious. We're talking a serious topic. I mean, you know, these particular topics happen to be. We're also, though, we're going to get back to talking about enthusiastic groups. I'm going to pick up where Ronald Knox left off. I want to talk about even the serpent handlers, man. Even serpent handlers. We're going to talk about cults. We're going to talk about weird enthusiastic sects, stuff like that. So that's going to be a whole bunch of fun, but that's it, once this series is over. <clears throat> So he says right here, work is sacred, honorable, and exalted. Work is your duty. In a company of ladies, conversations happen to turn upon ornaments most suited to women. He's talking about this one day, you're hearing a story. And a lot of things about, um, you know, uh, gold chains, earrings, brooches, jewels in general. A lady who had hitherto remained silent was uh, appealed to at length 
and asked to give her opinion as to what ornament best befitted a woman. And she said a thimble. She was perfectly right in attributing so much importance to this modest little thing. For the thimble is a symbol of feminine occupation. It's one of those things where, you know, when you're, again, attributing so much importance to this little thing. She was right to to attribute importance to it. That's not to say the others are of zero significance whatsoever. In the grand scheme, ultimately, yes, but so would ultimately the thimble in and of itself. I'm not opposed to adornments. I'm not opposed to physical beauty. I'm not opposed to people looking appropriate for their station in life. I think that's I think that's fitting. I think, you know, it's okay for a lady to look elegant. I see no reason for them to look like, you know, potato sack Sally. There's no reason for that. Monkey Brain says, Jer- uh, Jeremiah, Jeremy, I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> I'm not listening to you, Monkey Brain. Say, Jeremy, I don't know any Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremiah, check out uh, Rollo Tomasi. If you're listening to Kevin Samuels, he's way more articulate and better understands modern man and women's predicament. I'm down. I'm not, I don't, I don't listen all the time. I'm familiar with, with Samuel's work. Right. But, you th- but thank you. I will definitely, I'll definitely check that out. In fact, um, let me go ahead. I'll, I'll screenshot it right now so that I don't forget. I don't want to have to, well, I, I'll, I can go through, but I don't want to forget it. So let me just screenshot that real quick. And that way, here we go. Monkey brain. Boom. All right. So there we go. You must not only value work very highly, you must also love it. Well, people can say, well, what do you mean by loving it? Right? The highest praise which can be bestowed upon a girl is to say of her that she's industrious, never tired of work, but always usefully occupied. I love, and this, this is where people, you know, they're like, oh, she's always occupied. And you go, no, 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 no. Always usefully occupied. There's a difference between a busy body and someone who is industrious. Therefore, a maiden who desires to please God and to act in accordance with his will, applies herself to the exact and faithful performance of the duties which befit her age and position in life. You know how many women I know who are really sad and they're very lonely and they're wondering where all the good men are? And they're like, I don't know where, and and look, there's a lot of guys. I mean, we live live in a, a, you know, a a time when dudes are, are really messed up too. I mean, you know, we live in a world, think about this. We live in a world where you have, you have tons of women who feel like there's no men who care about them and don't want to be with them. And you have a bunch of guys who, thinks the, who think the girls want nothing to do with them. You would think that those two teams would simply just team up and say, wow, you both exist. All right, here we go. Bada boom, bada bing. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. These, you know, these groups are both existing in a freaky world. And so many guys end up simping out. They don't know what to do. They become wonder simps. <laughs> you wonder how they exist. <laughs> and you go, man, you are not getting the ladies this way. You, well, you might, but you're the getting the kind of lady where you're going to say, yeah, uh, my, my wife's boyfriend bought me a Nintendo Switch for Christmas. <laughs> no. No, you need to dude smack that guy in the face. Snap him out of it. The welfare of the household, the happiness of the entire family is, in the majority of instances, found to depend on the prudence and conscientiousness with which women discharge their domestic duties. Right, so you got, you got the father toiling unceasingly from morning to night. His earnings will profit him little if his wife and his daughters do not practice economy. So if, if you come home, a dude, let's say a dude... He's out there. Wife says, I don't want to go to work. I want to be at home with the kids. I want to take care of the kids. That's what I want to do. I don't want to have to go to work. And the, and, and the, and the husband's out there. He's doing the grind. He's, he has to, to, to force himself all the time to look past that manager who's always going, yeah, um, okay. That guy, he's got to look past that and try to find the Lord. He's like, God, help me. I can't, I can't cope with this. Another day, another dollar. 
sweat of the brow stuff. <laughs> and they get home, and when they get home, the place is trashed, and the wife is on the phone and uh, on an app. Social media, giggling at it, dumb stuff. Not connecting in any way that's meaningful beyond itself. It's here today, gone tomorrow, flash in a pan. Nothing. And what are the kids doing? Being lazy, sitting around doing jack crap. <laughs> what are they doing? Nothing. Not even good in school. So not any of that. Food ain't made, no nothing. You know, uh, uh, clothes piled up everywhere. House is looking all nasty, but the TV is on. Maybe the TV and the phone and the, uh, the iPad and a tablet. Somebody's on their cell phone when they shouldn't even have one. And the dad comes in and sees that. That, that would be a group of people not doing what they're supposed to do. And they ought to give serious honor to the dad for being the kind of man who goes out and does that. I'm serious about, you know how many dads don't get respect, but that's what they do? You know how many dads wake up every day and they have to go to work and they do all of that and they come home to a bunch of little scumbags <laughs> that, aren't, that aren't taking care of business? And why? Because, to be quite frank, no offense to the ladies, because some wives are scumbag wives. You need to tell them like it is. You got to say, stop being a scumbag. What are you made for, woman? What did God make you for? And if she says not to make your sandwich, say, well, <laughs> better my sandwich than that Facebook. No offense to you. But I ain't even saying go make a sandwich. I'm saying teach your daughter to be a good future wife. I'm saying make sure, make sure that the kids are, are being uh, uh, developing into remarkable creatures and that we can walk into this home and feel happy about our home. I work every day to make sure you can live here. That's honor where it's due, guys, isn't it? Ladies, isn't it? Or is that too demanding? And think of the alternative, ladies. Think of the alternative. The alternative would be, I have a right to sit here on my phone all day. I made babies. I have a right to sit here on my Facebook. I have a right to sit here and watch a bunch of soap operas. <laughs> I don't need to make you any food. You gotta make yourself a sandwich. <laughs> I don't need to clean any clothes. God made me so I can sit here and get fat in sweatpants. Sweatpants and sandals. With socks on. Slippers. <laughs> Even worse. It's just wicked bad. This is right here. Furthermore, without work, order, and cleanliness can never be had in the house. And when disorder prevails, the state of things is very uncomfortable. It is the duty of the female members of the family to see that everything is clean and well arranged. For upon this contentment, cheerfulness, and very often the health of all depend. So it's not, it's not a matter, again, is it there to please the eyes of the husband who comes in sweaty and grimy? Nobody, nobody's saying that the lady should look and say, wow, my, my husband just got home. My husband's sweaty and gross. And that's a real turn on. Boy, that's really sexy. Maybe some ladies are like that. Well, maybe some ladies see that and they're like, man, my husband's never hotter than when he comes back from the coal mine. <laughs> hey. There's all different types, man. But unlikely. For one, women aren't even as, as visually oriented as the men. Right? A man could see a wife walking in, and I, I know I'm ragging on the whole idea of the sweatpants and the, the, the slippers and the socks, you know, the curlers and stuff with the f Facebook. A dude, if you know, he's going to walk in, he still might might actually be down with him. <laughs> and saying like, hey, baby, I think we should go upstairs. It's possible. Men are kind of like that, and Johnny Apple seeding it up in the world. It's the way God made men. Women, on the other hand, are far more selective. Why? Well, there's, for one, if they get pregnant, it shows. They, there's no mystery. 
There's no, there's no wondering. You know, you can, you can have a show on Maury Povich of, you know, are you the, <clears throat> are you the baby's daddy? But there's no show that's like, are you pregnant? <laughs> a lady is going to eventually look very, quite pregnant. You know, even the ones like my wife who remarkably, you know, don't look that pregnant ever. <laughs> She's cranking out babies left and right. And so the thing is, you know, <laughs> where was I even going? Oh, uh, you know, but you got you got to. Most people aren't that way, right? Most people are not that way, and women are women are able to be more selective, and so that that plays out not just in how they select a partner, not just how they they select a husband, right? But also kind of in day to day stuff. You got you got to show that you're legit. If you're somebody who's not out there and you're not working and trying really hard to make stuff for the family, why do you expect her to do that? You know how many guys sit around at home, sitting around playing on live action role play stuff, a bunch of weird LARP and junk, and all these guys sitting there doing that? Hey, baby, I saved the princess. And she's like, you know, you could actually do something for the princess in the house. Hold on, I'm on level 27. Why do you think she's going to be into you, bro? Are you showing her on the daily that you are working and striving not only to secure the place that you're saying is her castle? You can tell her all day long, this is like your castle, baby. You got to work. You could try to do that all day long. But if you're sitting there like a lump on a log, you're sitting there. No, you have no vision. You have no managerial skills inside the house at all. You feel like it's entire. You're the one telling her, go, go make me a sandwich. While she, you're surrounded by plates that you haven't put away. If you're that guy. And you're not providing anything more than that. You know what? Bravo to the lady who, number one, remarkably married you. Number two, that she actually does anything for you at all. Because she must be seeing through you to see Christ, who she ultimately is serving in doing any of it. It cuts both ways. It cuts both ways. It's why it wasn't good for a man to be alone. And it's why a woman leaves her... Uh, Mother and father and cleaves into the man. It's together. Takes two to tango, and that is more than the marriage bed. It's life. No one ought to blame a girl for laying stress upon neatness and cleanliness in the house and also in her dress. Her pleasing exterior should be an image of her soul. So there are people, you know, you, you'll see saints like John Chrysostom, you know, uh, coming against. Uh, certain um, ornaments, right, right, on the woman, right? So they say, oh, yeah, it's a certain spectacle, that sort of thing. But I think that's where we get lost in it and say, well, is it really spectacle if you're not trying to, to, you know, slather makeup all over yourself, but you are complimenting what you're doing, who you are? So you say, well, these would actually be colors that would go good with me. Here's a, a moderate amount of, of blush, or here's a moderate amount of this. You don't need to look like a clown, like a rodeo clown, you don't need to look like the, the people from TBN, right? All decked out with gold and everything else. You don't need to have all that, flashing it in front of people. But if you say, there is a beauty inside of me. I'm a child of the king. I don't need to be potato sack Sally. I don't need that. And by the way, man, Jake, dude, we're all praying for your daughter, bro. And if, you, if people are tuned in, they don't know what I'm talking about. At the beginning of the show, we, we prayed for. We love you, dude, for real. Let us know. Keep, keep us informed, buddy. We're in it together, man. Lasan says it doesn't come from pride. It costs no money. So he's, he's not saying go out and buy the fanciest dresses in the world. With care and pains, a neat so it's, it's, he says it's not easy. He's not saying, oh, it'll be easy. Just go to the store and just spend a bunch of money and, and, and make yourself look super dope. Nothing wrong with making yourself look okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have a pleasing appearance. can be attained amidst the poorest surroundings in every condition of life. Carelessness, slovenliness, and want of cleanliness are bad traits in a girl. That is very true. <laughs> that's very true I've known some folks I've known some ladies in fact I've known 
a lot of ladies. And I've, I've gone been in different homes, and I'm like, dang, son. That's pretty gross. You know, it's like stacks of pizza boxes everywhere. You know, there's like, you, you don't know what's going on. There's dead mice on the ground. You're like, dude, how long has that one been there? And they're like, I don't know. I just saw that for the first time. It's like all decaying. It's like, that thing has been there like a couple months. <laughs> oh, no, I think I, you know, I did see that one. That was like a couple, yeah, that might, a couple, maybe five or six. <laughs> they're like, get me out of here. Get me out of here, lady. You're a sicko. I've seen people who, who you know, talk about how humble they are and pre- project themselves as potato sack Sally, right? Knapsack Nick, that kind of stuff. And and you're like, dude, that's actually not humble. You are you are in that sense, you are a spectacle. You are you are in that sense drawing attention to yourself by by claiming that you're not. So you roll into a church, you start looking like you know, start looking like the Amish folks and stuff. You might you might stand out a little bit. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, you know, you're you're what people are paying attention to. But if you're in if you're in company. This generally kind of a modest income. I mean, if you're like dirt broken stuff and you're wearing, you know, clothes that are kind of junky, that's just the way that is. But if you're somebody who's like, you know, why not make clothes that are okay for you to wear? And why do you expect if you're if you're somebody and you're like, look, why can't everybody just see past all of that? Why can't they just see past the clothing or see past my hair or see past the fact that I'm wearing, you know, the slip skis with the with the sake wackies and stuff, or, or, you know, and the sweatpants. Why, why, why can't they see past that? And you're like, for one, you have kind of a Herculean notion of what people do. Number two, you do the same thing all the time. We're people of heuristic. We're people of heuristic that says we, we have a thing all too often where when we see people and we see them dressed a certain way, we make snap judgments. Talked about it last night on a live chat over at the Wolfpack chat that went on. (laughs) Man, it really, I won't even say how late. <laughs> There's a reason I got dark rings under my eyes today. It's bad. It's, it was not good. But it was a fun time. We were talking about uh, the media theorist Marshall McLuhan and him being asked about people who are dressed like hippies and if he thought that that was okay. And he said yes. He said he, do, he doesn't necessarily have a problem with the way that people dress or their hair or whatnot. He said, however, they need to understand that people are pattern seekers. We, we seek patterns rapidly. And we do that so that we can compartmentalize and say, well, you're probably this or probably that. It's one of the reasons people, you know, they say all the time, you know, I hear this, not all the time. I hear many people say this sort of thing, that the reason why uh, Hollywood is always using um, Catholic churches and stuff is because they just want to rip on the Catholic church. Um, It's a heuristic. Like if if you, if you throw up a, a, a podium and a man in a suit. What is that? <laughs> what is that? It's hard to tell. What about a guy in a Roman collar? You've now limited, you, you've now at least whittled it down. What if you throw up a crucifix? Okay, well, you whittled it even further. What if you have an altar? Whoa, okay, well, that's even more. You know, so you have these, these symbols that we recognize very quick, and we make decisions and judgments based on that. That's why the, the, the priest, they say, look, you, ask a priest how often people walk up to them and ask them, you know, questions. Hey, you're, you're a priest, right? What gave you that idea? <laughs> what gave you that idea? The very thing that they saw that drove them to that place. And I said, yeah. It's the same thing with the way that we dress. It's the same thing with what we do. You look like those goth kids out of South Park. You know, people are going to be thinking you went to Hot Topic and such. You listen to maybe sad music and everything and light candles and listen to The Cure in a, in a bathtub at night with bubbles. I'm not dogging that. I, I do that sometimes. <laughs> you know, but I'm not dogging that. Not the hot topic, right? You know, <laughs> but, but the, the Cure listening to Bubble Bath. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, like, people, people can see that. They can see somebody and they might say, you know, hey, like last night we were talking to a guy. Really cool dude over on uh, in the Wolfpack. We're in a chat. We're talking to him, and um, he's you know he's talking about. Uh, I saw him. He has long hair and everything. And I said, well, I said people could look at him and say they they would assume maybe he's either like let's say in a band, or that he's he's an artist. 
Well, lo and behold, the guy's like, well, yeah, you know, I play music. I have a guitar. He showed he had, he had a cool guitar in the background. He said he used to be in a band. He's not currently in a band, but then he's also an artist, and he showed one of his paintings. It's a really cool painting of, of uh, Calvary. It's really cool. And by the way, keep painting, bro. Keep playing that music, too. It was really great talking to you. And so, you know, we see that. Those, those people can say, well, that's a stereotype. And you're like, well, <laughs> there's a reason why. It's not as if the stereotype is across the board. There, there are, are amazing exceptions to that. That's true. But there's a reason why those patterns emerge. And there's a reason why we can look at those patterns. It's the same kind of thing in our mind that we do when we see, you know, a, a, a chaise lounge and we see a couch and we, we say, well, that's something we can lay on. We see the, the similarity in that. In fact, we might even call them both a couch at first. A little bit couchiness going on there, you know? So, like, we see that and we see the connection. People can say, well, that's a, how dare you? That's a chaise lounge. <laughs> that's not a coach. That's not a sofa. That's a chaise. You're like, <laughs> you know, functionally, it's the same, right? We can lay on that thing. You can sit on it. You can lay on it. It's kind of cool. In fact, I need to get one. But we need to accept that, that that's part of the deal. It's one of the reasons why I, I said yesterday, I, I said, look, I, you know, people were talking about how hard it is to find a girl. And I said, look, man, I said, you know, they were talking about being online and going through profiles and going on Instagram. I'm like, what? what? Same thing with the girls. I know a lot of girls like that. Not all of them. Some girls really put themselves out there and they, they, they have a hard time. Right. And so we should be praying for each other for one. But number two you know, like I said, part of it is is going out and being around a person. I said, when you're around somebody, it's a lot different, right? Like if you, and think of it just for yourself. If you ever tried to share like a profile picture and you see it and you don't like the way you look in it, so you take it from a little bit of a different angle. Have you ever done that? I'm not talking about the angle up a little bit high where the the it cuts off the forehead and kind of strangely enough shows the chest in the center where people's eyes naturally gravitate and they may not fully understand why they, they're doing that. <laughs> but it's still the same thing. Right? They're basically flashing their leg on the side of the street. I don't mean to be rude about them, but I mean, that's what it is. And so the thing is, is like, how often do we put that picture up and we change it, we modify it, we don't like how our chin looks, we don't like how this looks, and we're not, we might even sit there and say, man, I'm glad nobody's smelling me right now. I'm smelling pretty grody, smelling pretty gross. And so, you know, to sit there and say, but that's part of it, right? That's part of it. And, and, and to get to know me, to get to know maybe I'm a little bit more awkward because all they're going to see is a profile picture and a bio. And I get to select whatever that is. But if I'm in a group of people and, I can, and this person happens to be there, they're going to see me not just for the way I fidget, the way I talk, the way I look at different angles. But if they get close enough, maybe they're going to see the way I smell. They're going to see the clothes I wear. They're going to see the way I move my hands. And so they're going to see it. And in doing that, they're going to have multiple sensory experiences of you. A more robust thing. I said, that's why, you know, think of the difference between this. In a world of, of checking people out on their profiles, checking people out on their profiles, what, what ends up happening? You, you, you see very quickly. You're still doing the pattern thing, right? But now it's rapid fire. And you're looking to say, does this person like, you know, what kind of music do they like? What kind of TV do they watch? In real life, when you're, when you're in a room with somebody, you might not even have that conversation for the third, until the second, third, fourth, fifth time you even talk to them. And you might actually find out that you've already started being attracted but to each other, that attraction has already started happening for a bunch of other reasons. And by the time you get to the conversation about music, you might end up in the same crazy world that me and my wife are in, that she likes K-pop. She likes watching shows like Running Man. I mean, that melancholic, you know, milk carton kid music, arcade fire sound and stuff. Smashing pumpkins. She's like, yeah, that was okay. They're old stuff. I'm like, that's true. 
<laughs> we agree on that. <laughs> right? the, the old stuff before, you know, he shaved his head and started wearing robes and stuff. <laughs> Looking all magic. Looking all mystical and such. But you sit there and you go, look, this is one of those things where where opposites in many ways do attract. But when you're when you're online, how many people are looking for individuals who have opposite values? Not not opposite values, opposite likes and interests on things that uh, like because you can't no mix into that, right? That's so you can say, look, we're in, we're in a, we're in a chat like uh, like uh, uh, Tim Gordon's got where it's it's Catholic people, traditional people, they come together. But how many people are going to look and try to find? that they have aligned interests on a whole bunch of other things. And how many people, and I, this, is, this might be hard, I don't mean to go too far off topic. I'm probably losing people left and right. People are getting mad about it. That's okay. It's part of the series, and I hope, I hope people benefit from this. I think it's, look, it was, it was serious enough that he wrote about it, and it's true. But to sit there and say, you know, how, how, many, how many people... How many people um, find themselves attracted to people of completely opposite um, interests and stuff like that, right? And and they 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 find themselves, um, you know, at times having a difficult time, even like once they're married, they're talking and stuff, and they find it difficult. And how many people, before they got married, and or, or I, I, let let me rephrase this. This is better. For all the people who are not married and are frustrated about not being married, okay? If you're a woman, for example, and let's say you're one of those that for whatever reason growing up you had a best friend who's a man and you have this idea that you don't want to date that person because it might end up ruining it and you might ruin the relationship with that person. Let me say two things. Number one is that if you end up with another man, you're probably not going to be spending nearly as much time with the other guy. And in fact, there will be a tension between the man you end up with and the man who's the man that was your best friend from before. Same thing, vice versa. How many girls start dating a guy? I had a, I had a, a best friend that was a girl growing up. She was my best friend. Started dating a girl. We got super serious. Next thing you know is like, I, I don't know if you should really be spending so much time with that other friend. Because you start wondering. It gets territorial. That's just true. Unless you're an anarchist, you shouldn't have a problem with that. The territorial stuff. And saying, like, look, that's just the way it rolls. But the other thing is, is not not only is that person not going to be your best friend forever like that, probably. In all likelihood, they shall not. They, in fact, it would be inadvisable, probably. But, mo but even more importantly is this. Is that if you think about it. You know, I, I can look back over time now. I, I can look and I can say, um, you know, my wife and I, we're not just married, but she's my best friend. She's my closest confidant and my best friend. And that actually took time. And I guess I kind of wonder sometimes if we've allowed the world and, and our secular age and how it affected the way that we do mate pairing, if that, if that kind of affected that, then we look at those best friends and we count them out and say, no, 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 no. I just know him and I know he would never hurt me. I know he would trust me. I know that he he's divulged things to me. I know that he only wants to see me thrive. I know he prays for me. I know he goes to church. I know he works hard because, you know, after he's done working, we hang out together and we can just talk about a lot of stuff. Yeah, we've got disagreements and we don't agree on everything in the world, but he's a really great guy. But I would hate to mess up that relationship by taking it seriously. <laughs> How crazy is that? How crazy is that? How many people right now are lonely right now because they have not taken seriously their best friend, which in the end if they end up putting themselves out there for people that they don't know, end up walking away with a broken heart because they've, they've said, I, I'm following the feeling. I've, I've learned to follow the feeling. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I feel something for that guy. And so you end up with him, and next thing you know, you're tossed to the curb because the guy's a complete jerk face. And who's there for you? Your best friend. Your best friend. And so you sit there and you go, man, that's the, the, the whole idea of this is to say if the, if the end goal, if the, if the aim of your endeavor 
with, with mate pairing like this, to find a husband, to find a wife, if the end result of that together is that you're not just married, but that you, and not just even just that you truly love each other and you're like, I'm really into her, we're making babies, but that she's your best friend or that he's your best friend, then I think we need to maybe consider wiping the glasses, a little bit of the romanticism off of our glasses the not so enlightening enlightenment ideas. Wipe that a little bit off a little bit and go, ah, you know, is this actually somebody that might be there for me through a thick and thin as they have been thus far and proven it by my side, caring about me? Talking about, you know, when you leave, we're running out of time. I'll go about five more minutes and then we'll, we'll wind down. To do all this is no light matter, right? To leave or to work. You got to rise early. You got late to rest. It leaves no leisure for lounging, for gossip or bad company, for useless strolling hither and thither. <laughs> I love you, final science. <laughs> oh, I love you, buddy. Oh, I love you. <laughs> it leaves no room for leisure, for lounging, for gossip and bad company, for useless strolling hither and thither. And everyone's like, oh, I know all about the hithering and thithering. <laughs> know all about those strollers. And Marilyn, thank you. God bless you, Jeremiah. I love the energy. Thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate it. If you're not a member of the Wolfpack yet, if you're not, uh, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's like, the, it's like the chat and we do personal things, you know, videos all the time, live chats. And we pray with each other. So we, we crank up the video and uh, we'll host prayer things, pray the rosary together, chaplets, all that. And it helps even just keep people on track. People are even learning to, to pray the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to pray the hours of the day. Um, we have uh, somebody there, Veronica, she's been doing that. And it's just awesome. It's totally awesome. So, But thank you. I, I really appreciate it, Marilyn. You know, pride yourself on liking your work. You know, do those things, attend to domestic affairs and interest yourself in their details, not by mere words or by finding fault or making critical remarks, but by putting your hand to it. He talks about, he talks about the benefits of living in the country and I, I won't really go into that right now. Yeah, I like how Haley says that if you like this comment section, you should check this out. Thank you, by the way, Haley. If your work is to be done really well, if it is to please God and gain merit for yourself, you must see that you perform it with a good intention. Right? That when you wake up, that you should sit there in the beginning of the day and you should simply say, you know, st stirred up, oh, oh, oh my God, I will do everything for the love of thee. Help me to be patient and to persevere. He's talking about, you know, how fortunate ladies are when they're when they are permitted to remain under the roof of their family until that time where they can get married, where they can leave their their mother and father and cleave unto their husband. That there's a value in that, and I, I mean it's un unquestionably true. But he says that times have changed. A lot of women now uh, they engage more formally in business. They take themselves away from the home. Man must plunge into strenuous life. Man must go forth to his daily work and confront the dangers of the world. If this should be the case with you, talking also about women, if you must go forth and encounter the dangers of the world, then you got to lay your heart on these things. First of all, be sure it's really necessary for you to do that. I'll end with his recommendations for this. I've got more. I'll, I'll dedicate the next show also to the dignity of work. and A different, a different angle on it, okay? First of all, be sure it's really necessary for you to leave home and go among strangers where life will be fraught with dangers for you. So many girls allow themselves to be deceived in this respect, either by their own heart or by persuasions of other people. Talking about being crazy for amusement. They, they feel at home that, you know, the, the life at home or the life of the mother or the life of the wife, that somehow that's, that's being hampered and restrained. That living in a smaller town and in a village, that that's somehow a, a, a restraint. Now, I take I am not with him entirely on this. I am someone 
who says, yes, there are great... I've lived in the countryside. I've lived in a city. I understand that the city is wrought with a great many uh, vices that you do not often find in small communities. But I think there's a value to a cultured life where you sit there and say, yes, we actually do have a ballet theater. We do have uh, Catholic academies that you can go to with classical uh, education. We do have uh, symphony orchestras. We do have theater. That we do have many businesses of this kind. That we do have hospitals. That we do have churches. That we do have events. I, I, don't, I don't see that as like, well, those are okay, but just go live out in the country. I don't, I'm not part of that. Okay. I'll, I'll always have that country boy thing going on. I'll always prefer night times under clear skies with, you know, a, a, a fire out by the pines in the backyard and hearing the sounds of frogs in the, in the spring and hearing the sound of owls at night and stuff like that. Seeing the prints of, of deer and their hooves in the snow and not having a bunch of, you know, the trails coming out from planes above me yeah. and saying there's something good about that, right? Something good about that. He says right here, he says, there are others, though, that are allured. And they say, look, you can imagine, how, yeah, this is where he, where he basically says that what I've said. He disagrees with what I've said. So if you, I encourage you, if you would like to read that, make sure to go. I'll, in fact, I'll, I'll include the, that particular part, and I'll put it on uh, Telegram, and I'll put it on the website. That way people can v evaluate for themselves and say, do they believe this particular part or is it an overemphasis on rural living? Because I think that there's a balance. I think that even the Pope's, in their, in their social encyclicals, have talked about the equilibrium between various sectors of political economy, uh, one of those being farmland. And I think that people can overemphasize that in the same way that many modern uh, views of political economy overemphasize the town, the city. He says, but if you're really, if you're really obliged to leave home, what do you do then? What do you do? You must not jump to the first place that offers itself through advertisement in a paper. Same thing with a man. Same thing with a woman. You may be, you may be a, a super desperate person. You may be getting older and frustrated, saying, why are, why are we acting more like orcas <laughs> that are sticking around with their families for a long time instead of more like humans from the days of old? You go, well, they, you know, they were like 13 or 14. <laughs> you know, you're like, well, no, I mean, like in the middle. Oh, I was 18 years old, 19 years old, or 20, even 21, man. Wouldn't that be great? You know, like, man, I'm not, I was, I was 26 or I was 30. And more and more people are ending up like the, the chick that wrote uh, Sex in the City, that by the time she's older, she's sad. She made her entire claim to fame was on, was on this, this series that said the working woman, the independent woman, and now she's older and the pipers come a piping. And what ends up happening? She's watching as all of her friends who are older, who didn't take her advice, who didn't think that the show was sagacious and a trailblazing thing for how women ought to live, are surrounded by their children and their grandchildren. And what is she doing? She's petting cats at home. And look, the cats are grateful. I'm grateful that people are petting cats. <laughs> but they're alone. They're lonely. She regrets it, by the way. Because they grow up in the dark. Right? They, they ask themselves, what, what kind of wage are you offering? Right? And the higher they are, so much the better they consider the situation. But these, these persons too often wreck both their temporal and eternal happiness, having lost when they return home at a subsequent period, both their virtue and their reputation. It's totally, totally true. It's totally true. And so I want to say, let me see here. Here we go. I'll, I'll end with this one. It's the last one. So when all is said and done, when all is said and done, swiftly time speeds on its way, though we fain would bid it stay. Employ it well, work while you may. Night soon succeeds to life's brief day. Momentum mori. The decisions you make in this life matter. It's, it's like the gladiator, you know? It's, it echoes into eternity type thing. Because it does. What you do here really matters. It's a very serious game. And people, 
People say that, you know, this show, this particular episode or the one before, that it's gotten very serious. And I said, well, we actually are dealing with stuff that I deal with too many people who struggle with this. I deal with too many people in my life that they really are having a very hard time. They're depressed. They're down and out. They're lonely. They're maybe, maybe they, due to various terrible decisions, have allowed themselves to lose, quote-unquote, market value, right, in the mating marketplace, to sit there and say, yeah, you know, I had a bunch of kids. I wasn't married. I was reckless with this stuff. There are some serious things that, that people have to do Yeah, and by the way, I don't know what is going on here <laughs> in the comments, but I like Patty. I don't know what Patty's talking about. What What is Patty talking about? I'm sorry, Patty, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe it's off topic. I, I, don't, I don't know. But I, I don't know what I don't know what it was about. If, if, it's, if it's something that was that was <laughs> worthy of getting deleted. That was Louie. Oh, 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 that was my son. That was my son. Patty, I apologize. <laughs> my Angela just came in and she she told me, she said, that was Louie. I apologize. Because I saw it last time. I don't want I, that to happen I again. I pressed view, but I don't know if it shows up. Yeah, it's not showing up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, they're also saying, let me see here. Can I, can I, no. So I, but I can see it though. I can see, I, I'm going to take a screenshot so that I can share it with people later. I, I, I really, I'm sorry that I interrupted that everybody to address that. And it says that he's uh, put in timeout for 300 seconds. Dude, I am truly sorry. I want you to know that from me. I actually meant to reach out to you because I saw it. And you know, I, <laughs> you know me, man. You follow me for a minute. I people can run wild, do what they want, as long as they're not, you know, over over the line. But I'm seeing what you're saying here. I, I asked people to say it. Do cities matter? Yes, I think so. Catholicism is an urban religion. Rural areas are needed for sure, um, and they have unique virtue possible. I I agree with you on that. About how God is best understood in the city. Yeah, that's people say. Well, the village, and you go. Yeah, but back then that was a city. Yeah, man. So, so Patty, I hope you are. I hope you're listening, and I just want to say I'm sorry. But, but, but back to the point. Back to the point. Okay. So, and yet you, you I don't know if you banned Haley, but she says you know, <laughs> uh, you did not. She's saying she did not do that. Okay. Uh, not entirely sure, and, and I'll let you debate the rest of it between between her and stuff like that. Um. So. Here's the thing. We can talk about that in the in the chat. We can have conversations all day long. I don't know why you're not there, Patty. I don't know why you're not there. I know you got some conspiracy theory about it. But the idea is that time is swiftly passing. We got to make these decisions. It's extremely tough. But it's it's to the point where if we keep using the tools of the world and the, those tools keep letting us down, there's got to be a line where we finally say, you know, maybe it was kind of crazy that we did it that way. Maybe it's not entirely wrong. Maybe, you know, I don't, maybe we don't need to return to the matchmaker, you know, begging for matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Maybe we don't need to be doing that. But at the same time, maybe we should be going back to more traditional models and saying, look, people were married. They made children. They helped to make this, this world what it is. They strove really hard. They worked with the sweat of their brow. The ladies out there being like the woman from Proverbs. And maybe maybe there's a way that we can look at it, and that's going to take us looking at ourselves and what do we expect. And if we expect something big like a high-value man or a woman that's going to remain at home, then maybe we're not living up to the expectations that make that a realistic possibility in the market. You know what I'm saying? Then maybe maybe we're not doing. Maybe the ladies are are not doing their part to say I I I, I want a high value man, but I'm kind of by the looks of things and the feel of things and maybe the smell of things <laughs> that that I am 
I'm, I'm wanting a free lunch a little bit. And maybe the man is sitting there saying, I want a woman who's traditional. I want a woman who's going to be taking care of business at the home and raising kids this way. And yet at the same time, that man is not doing anything in his life to try to try to encapsulate a vision and say, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to work with all of my might, settle on what it is that I have to do and give it everything I've got six days a week from morning to night. I'm going to do everything. And when it's over, I'm at home with the family. He wants a free lunch too. Everybody's crying because they all want free lunches. Including people who say, well, no, I'm doing all those things. And you say, well, where are you going to find them? Well, I'm going on to Instagram. <laughs> oh. Stop. Stop. Just enough even to just think and pray. And to keep tuning into the show. Yeah. To keep tuning in. And why? What's this? Uh, what is that? What is this? Oh, no. No. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, very grateful for all of you. You know, agree or disagree, okay? It's okay. Reach out to me. We're try we're scrambling for to try to figure stuff out. We want to know what we can do. Because we're living through hard times. You're seeing how many people are falling away from the faith. You're seeing how many people are contracepting their kids out of existence, aborting their kids out of existence, LGBTing their kids out of existence. Global warming, the kids out of existing, saying, I oh, don't, don't do that because of global climate change, because of equity. The world is filled with reasons. Why not to get married? The world is filled with reasons. Why to follow your lust and your passions? And people have played into it. They've played to the tune. And the pipers come. But we have we have a king. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He cares about you. He cares about the birds of the air. He cares about the flowers of the field. If that's true, if he knows the, the, the you know, a, a, a bird drop into the ground, or he knows the hairs on your head, then he definitely knows about what you want to be as a husband, as a wife. He knows what it takes to be a father and a mother. He knows that. He's provided us examples. But more than that, he's provided us his ear. And he said, knock. Knock, beat that bad boy down. Cry very loud. And then work that out. Work, trusting in me, resigning yourself to me. Maybe even questioning a vocation. <sighs> Love all of you. Appreciate it. Pray for, pray for Jake and the family. Until next time, never give up. Keep on smiling. And momentum more. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.